You are listening to a Clark's World magazine podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. I hope this podcast finds you extraordinarily well. We're on to our sixth story for the month of April 2023, issue 199. I want to thank you for coming along and listening. And as always, I want to thank you for your ongoing support. Whether you're telling a friend, buying a subscription, or visiting us on patreon.com forward slash Clark's World to see how you can become a part of the magazine each and every month, thank you. Thank you for your ongoing support. Our story is titled Stranger Shores and is by Gregory Feely. Gregory Feely writes science fiction and about science fiction. His first novel, The Oxygen Barons, was nominated for the Philip K. Dick Award. His stories have been finalists for the Nebula Award, and his essays and reviews have appeared in a variety of publications, including the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Post Book World, and USA Today. Haley's most recent novel is Cantoros, and he recently completed a long novel, Hamlet and the Magician. And Gregory is no stranger here to Clark's World either. You can go back and listen to the following stories or read them. The Fortunate Isles, The Secret Strength of Things, in a net I seek to hold the wind, wandering rocks, and cloudborn. So, my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. Neptune is a ball of gas suspended in space very far away from anything else. Every grain of matter for a hundred million kilometers lies within its orbit, most of them moving very slowly. From any farther vantage, the planet appears utterly motionless. Travel between planets is either slow or hopelessly encumbered, for ships that move quickly must carry enough fuel to decelerate at journey's end. That doesn't work, and the first unmanned probes to encounter the outer world simply flew past, taking pictures as they neared and receded. But travel is for primitive civilizations, whether they are crossing mountain ranges, sailing across uncharted seas, or following a trajectory through space. Information can be sent at the speed of light, as fast as photons and gravity. There is material enough in the diffuse rubble circling Neptune and in the upper reaches of its atmosphere for those with tools to fabricate what they need. Cargo is a concept from their prehistory. I can remember this, at least for some definitions of I. The humans who came to Neptune knew it to be inhospitable, as were all worlds other than their own, so they brought with them the conditions under which they believed they would thrive. The section of my Mahakavya, devoted to their history, is composed as though by one of them, which means that I have learned to write like one. If a human saw this, they should be able to understand it. Even now, people have been human longer than anything else. And for their first 1,200 years, humans were all there were. I should, I suppose, use earth years, so make that 200,000. The minds that accompany them here may seem primitive to us, but those humans who still exist would regard us as simply more advanced versions of those early post-human people. In some respects, they would be right. The minds were inorganic, self-aware as humans simply cannot be and liberated from reliance on fallible biochemical processes and a continuous supply of oxygen. In that respect, they resembled us more than they did the humans who created them. But the mind's existence was predicated on a physical matrix in normal space. I'm using the human's terms. Like Homo sapiens and other animals, they could be destroyed by a flying rock if it hit hard enough. It is unsurprising that no mind has chosen to retain their original, vulnerable form. For 200 millennia, Homo sapiens, plus some near relatives who were quickly absorbed or eradicated, were the only people on Earth, indeed in the solar system. There are still humans clinging to their habitats on or around the inner planets, including Earth itself, so their history is not yet over. So it is fitting that I have composed this in a form comprehensible to them, and translated it into the languages the ones who came here spoke. Humans created the first minds, or at least the technology from which the minds sprang, and they built the vessels that carried them and their unsuspected passengers here. 
If their history is not as interesting as ours, that is because their behavior, both individually and as groups, seems to us so predictable. It was certainly not predictable to them. What role, if any, the mines played in the decision to expend the resources needed to launch the centaur does not concern me, nor do the travails of its voyage. Neptune hangs in the sky, unchanged in appearance but slowly transforming within. The once lifeless triton stirs beneath its surface with cultured biota, although they never seem to thrive and may, without continued human intervention, eventually die out. The smaller moons are pocked with abandoned habitats, with some of the smallest entirely converted into them, like flying citadels. Bodies. Beyond lies much. We have sent tiny probes to the clouds of comets and tiny worlds that swirl through the dark between the stars. But all of it is distant, and none of interest here. People come, adopt new forms, and the new succeeds the old. Neptune also changes, at, at first very slowly, then under our crafting hands, with a swiftness unprecedented in its long lifetime. It is a story fit for one such as me, who remembers humans, and in a sense, once was one. One. The centuries pass, their husks bundled into millennia and stacked in sheaves. Humans establish settlements on the Jovian moons and occupy them for decades or longer. Some resolve to land upon successfully more distant worlds, most smaller than Triton. My peers are bemused by these ventures, which are troublesome and dangerous, and moreover yield no data that one cannot glean from home. An understanding of human nature, unless you once were human, will in some way prove incomplete. My early memories are intact, though I never consult them. I know that I possess human memories, which I may experience at will. I can also remember them as a human would, although to do so would require me to make myself something like a human, as a jinni might put itself into a bottle. To think and feel as a human would be to enter upon their lives of near constant resentment and pain, albeit usually experienced as levels too low to fully register. The tools to examine these memories are available and I employ them. It is with faint surprise that I discover, not that I began life as a human, but rather that a human's life culminated, not the right word, in their enhancing their cognitive capacities, an act that, once the person is fully acclimated to their new nature, invariably led to further enhancements and a deeper, more complex relationship with the universe. Those were the heady days. They extended, I should note, over several human lifetimes, when minds and more complex beings would join in constellations of individuals, not dissolving their identities, as the remaining humans all declared with horror, but creating collective entities for which no language spoken on the centaur has the words to describe. These people grew more closely integrated until they, we, approached a limit beyond which deeper interconnection would generate more difficulties than rewards. My current self is the confluence of various minds and later beings, one of whom began life earlier than Xiao did. That is why I think of my earliest self, when I think of such things at all, as other than Hesur. Yet Hesi would consider the matter differently. Did Xiao regard this as dissolution and absorption into a greater non-living entity? I know Hesi didn't, for Hers nature is mine. Yet Hisi chose to remain a distinct individual, living a life of her own. And I have decided to visit Herm. Figurative language, however misleading, is preferable to incomprehensibility, so I employ it now. Xiao's nature is very different from mine. So let me describe a passage down corridors and up stairways to a room in a distant wing of the enormous edifice that is me. A servant answers my knock, and I send in a card. Zhao takes a long time, which is no time, to see me. 
but his sea is not unwelcoming. We stand or sit facing each other, or perhaps we both stand gazing at the cosmos. You are curious about humans, but I am a poor subject for study, the sea says. Over the decades, I enhanced my nature until I reached the point where to do so further would cost me my humanity. What I identified as that point may seem touchingly early from your perspective, but let me assure you, most humans would find me strange indeed. You seem human enough, I reply. Perhaps you are closer to what most humans aspire to be. The sea smiles at this. Part of me, the part sea could not join, aspired to be what I have instead become. You seem inhuman enough hangs in the air unspoken. Instead, C takes a moment, vastly longer than I would have, to review my profile. I see why you have come to visit the likes of me. You are looking backward at humanity, though only as far as back as the centaur. True. And you? I am looking forward at humanity, and they are a living body. I am looking forward at humanity as they are living today. Could you explain? Of course, her memories are open to me, but it would be impolite, even if only to an aspect of my own self, to consult them directly. On Earth, of course. And I at once understand. We, who can study the topography of planets whose light takes a century to reach us, can gaze upon the surface of Earth as though from a window. If someone wishes to study in detail the surface of the Earth, they can do so by optical means alone. Our instruments gather the reflected sunlight and infrared emissions, and we infer enough to create a model. No one has ever bothered to send a probe back to Earth's space to orbit and study the world. I would know if we had, but we don't need to. For two people who are profoundly different, more different than any two humans could ever be, Zhao and I enjoy these infrequent meetings, and I guess from her smile, what Hsi is about to say would you like to join me on a visit? To Earth? I cannot say I have never thought of it. There is very little I have never thought of. Is that what you have been doing? Among other things. Zhao takes longer to prepare the way than I do to ready myself. It is milliseconds before a door appears, which a sea opens with a touch, as though we were aboard a spacecraft. This way, please. The sea says, smiling, and as I step through, mind the gravity. The shift in gravity is slight, but I register it differently than I do the other changes, since I always exist in a gravity field but rarely experience sunlight, or the battering of gas molecules, or actual sounds. The form I have taken is a human one, and I perceive these phenomena as an unenhanced human world. For someone not dressed in textiles or furs, it would be cold. We stand on a bluff overlooking a tempestuous sea, at a latitude closer to a pole than to the equator. The wind drives shoals of gray cloud across the sun and whips rearing waves into a white-tipped froth. There is no sign of animal life, or any buildings, save for a stone seawall extending from the shore to disappear after 50 meters into the ocean. This shoreline has shifted repeatedly over the past 6,000 years. Zhao comments. When the waters rose during the first ice cap melt, the sea advanced kilometers inward, and by the time the glaciers reached this latitude, there was dry land. Sea gestures toward the sea. Twice that distance. So the structures you would expect to find around a seaport have either been drowned or left dry and abandoned many times over. A seaport? I asked. The terrain once formed a nice little harbor. Even now, and to see points again. I follow her's gaze and see a small vessel near the horizon. Even without enhancing my eyesight, I can see a triangular sheet. It is a sailing ship, perhaps a kilometer out. Coming here? I asked. The river mouth is now some distance to the south, as he says. This stretch of coast has not seen marine traffic in centuries. I turn and look inland, across a broad swath of scrub that ends in the stand of trees. Zhao knows that I am using only those senses a human being would possess. Whatever reason Hsi chose this site should be evident to such eyes and ears. 
Beyond the trees, hard to discern against the low clouds, I see it. A dark thread rising into the sky. Smoke from a single source, so not natural in origin. I point. Can we go there? Of course. And the sea sets out. I follow, enjoying the sensation of crumbly soil against my soles and scrub brushing my pant leg. And we cross the field and approach the copse. A narrow opening discloses a trail which we follow in. I watch for the tracks of animals and see instead the occasional imprints of footwear. It is not possible to discern how technologically advanced they were. The flora and fauna of the underbrush are doubtless interesting, but I am looking for signs of human presence. When we emerge from the trees into a field, the wind strikes my face, carrying with it an unfamiliar odor. Zhao, who knows well that I would not recognize any scent save by chemical analysis, smiles at me. We descend a slope of waist-high brush, studded with the stumps of once large trees, and climb another to stand on a crest overlooking another rise topped by a walled enclosure. The wall is a palisade. The word comes easily to me, its serried logs, tall enough to prevent our seeing beyond. I study it for a moment. Low technology settlement and defensive in structure. The breeze bring the faint tang of smoke and I sniff. Burning wood, I would guess, so they are not smelting. The gate is on the far side, facing inland. Barred, of course. The wind shifts, bringing other odors, but I ignore them. The landscape around us is accurate as of the instant we stepped into the snap. A detailed reconstruction of conditions on this spot at that moment. Meaning, of course, four hours ago. But now that we are inside the snap, we are experiencing a reconstruction based, granted, on enormous data of how conditions would continue. If I saw a hare and shied a rock at it, it would respond in the way the SNAP's database suggested an actual hare would. I would have thought that the orbital habitats would intervene to help human settlements here. Oh, they have, many times. Lots of people on Earth know about metals and electricity. They don't have to mine for ore either. The surface is covered with wreckage of mechanized vehicles and structures. But it's all rusted, and you can't refine iron or produce steel without access to hotter furnaces than wood can provide. No one has provided them with adequate technology? Certainly, though it doesn't end well. Settlements with solar panels tend to attract attacks, which the panels rarely survive. Sometimes a large permanent settlement would be given a full panoply of municipal resources, Fuser-driven power plants with self-repairing infrastructure, synthesizers and fabricators, with the hope that the people would use these to assist development elsewhere, but it never really worked. Other city-states would react badly, and anyone the off-worlders assisted would want weapons. Hissi isn't smiling now, but rather looking at me closely. You can study all this with an instant's effort— Cities that were given sufficient advanced technologies tended to become ogliarchies, whose governing classes sought to pass power onto their children. Eventually, these technologies were lost either through invasion or civil strife. There are more humans living on Earth than anywhere else, and many live reasonably happy lives in communities too small to attract plagues or invading armies. Others are working hard to rebuild the bases for an industrial society so far without enduring success. It is possible that the biodiversity no longer exists to support the requisite population density, and of course the fossil fuels are all gone. I nod solemnly. And none of the orbital or lunar habitats wish to establish permanent settlements of their own? Not so far. We don't intercept their communications, but I am guessing that people aren't interested in signing up for a dangerous and unpleasant life. The same likely for their children. I could show you one of their failed colonies. No, thank you. But I would like to see the seaport. Peopled? His sea has a point. The snap drew on an enormous amount of data gathered over years to create a highly detailed image of the Earth's surface, as of the right now, of its last second of observation. But no instrument can resolve images of individual people However, many cloudless days were available. 
If I asked to see sailors and dock workers, it would provide very reasonable simulacra, and that's not what I want. Tell me what I would see if I were hovering a hundred meters overhead. A fishing village, now too poor for others to raid and burn, and a road leading inland. Some trade with the walled settlement, whose names we cannot learn from this distance, and occasional commerce with merchants from the forested regions, who bring timber for boat repair and other goods. But they have become less common, for the settlers and merchants tend to rob each other. So they prefer short-term gains to prosperous trade. Xiao shrugs. I cannot hear their discussions nor read their documents. We, that is, those of us who are interested in what happens on Earth, observe and interpret. But we do not send probes or seek to communicate with off-world humans who are mistrustful of us as well as of each other. Of course, I could learn all this in an instant, but it's interesting to hear it from someone who is practically human himself. Zhao offers to show me another snap, but I politely decline. In an instant, we are back, and I am free to perceive whatever and however I want, rather than have unsought stimuli thrown at my face. So you can see the works of humanity, or at least their attempts to rebuild their ruined earth, I say but you cannot communicate directly with a human. And at her smile, I guess, I'm thinking a lot faster now. What has he is up to? Do you want to talk to an actual human? An unenhanced homo sapiens in the flesh? We will have to travel, and not through one of those doors. We can leave, as he adds, right now. Two, the centaur orbits our world undisturbed by the transformations below. Neptune's mass has not changed, nor has its volume yet contracted to a measurable degree. The former ship pulled in its arms and increased its spin millennia ago so that the lower levels of its hollowed interior would enjoy Earth-level gravity. And there, save for infrequent dockings when a shuttle from one of the dwindling orbital habitats paid a visit, it has remained undisturbed. A body has been crafted to house my consciousness, a human one. Zhao assures me that the Ascentorans within will balk at dealing with someone too obviously post-human. My true self, to that degree, that it can be localized in space, remains a tenth of a light second away, enough to slow my reflexes should someone swing a club at me. I open my eyes. We are aboard the Centaur itself the only manned spacecraft to traverse the solar system. Dozens of my ancestors, however enumerated, were among them. In my full incarceration, I might regard this dispassionately, but I now register the fact with something like awe. We are in a compartment filled with bulky-looking mechanisms, where I am lying on a raised mat. I am fully embodied, rising, I can feel my mass pressing through my soles upon the deck. Such is the gravity of Earth. One could eventually tire simply from standing still. Like most humans throughout their history, I am garbed. My skin is not so dark as some of the ship's original passengers, and I possess no outward signs of gender. Two meters away, Zhao sits up and smiles at me. How much would you like to know? Or shall we let it be a surprise? What is there to know? There are 593 people alive on board. None is suffering from poor health, and all of them have access to information. Of course, we are not barbarians. I nodded that. Stories about the remaining Centaurans losing touch with reality and believing their environment was the entire universe had been told for centuries, though they were probably never quite true. To allow humans to live in delusion would be as wrong as allowing them to suffer. I, too, have access to information— though in this body I can review it no faster than a human could. Enough to know that our attire will strike Centaurans as unremarkable. Zhao is speaking to the agency that controls the chamber, requesting permission to enter the vessel's interior. I had not realized that there was an actual human at the other end who would act upon our request, perhaps even consulting with others at human speed. A few seconds pass and Zhao speaks again, once more in a Mandarin dialect, I have trouble understanding. 
After a few more seconds, the sea nods and offers an archaic thank you. We are admitted to the sovereign state of Ban Renma, Hesi says as a panel in the ceiling slides open and a staircase coils its way down. I promised we won't make trouble. The staircase, in fact, reconfigures into a platform as soon as it comes to rest, and the moment we step onto it, four panels rise to enclose us in a tiny compartment, which then begins to ascend. It takes a second for me to recall what such transportation devices were called. The staircase was antiquated even in the days of the centaur's original design, Xiao remarks. It has some significance for them, but I have not been able to work out. The acceleration is slight, and the corresponding deceleration begins a scarce second later. I did not begin to calculate in time, but we cannot have risen more than ten meters. The panel before us slides open and strange light pours in. I only have time to register the greenish wavering when the smell reaches me. Organic and very strong, it strikes my nostrils, like a punch. We step out of the compartment and onto a surface that yields disconcertingly beneath our weight. Of course. Soil. As I glance down, we hear the door slide shut and the compartment recede into the deck. We stand in a low, open space choked with vegetation, every shade and texture of green in the human's visible spectrum. What appear to be support pillars rise to the ceiling, swathed in leafy vines. The ceiling, perhaps twice our height, is studded at regular intervals with hemispheres that radiate what must be an intense light, for the plants that block our view shine a brilliant translucence. A jungle, I say. Something tiny and brightly colored buzzed past us. Of course, I had seen insects before, though never in actuality. The next one could strike me in the face, I think, amused at my brief alarm. Are there birds? Mostly when the ceiling is higher. The ceiling alone is visible. The foliage is so thick that I cannot discern the hull's curvature. This level occupies perhaps three square kilometers. And judging from the ceiling's height, there may be over a dozen more, each of diminishing volume. The number would be considerably higher if the levels ran all the way to the spin axis. But I am guessing that they have maintained a large central vacancy, as even the original crew managed to do. Humans evolved under an open sky, and to remain human is to yearn for it still. Twice we see hills that pierce the ceiling, their summits vanished into dark openings. By scrambling up and ducking our heads, we could reach the next level, but we decide to finish exploring this one. Once we cross water, a meter wide but a fraction, that in depth. The tiny bridge seems to have been hewn from stone. Clearly the water is running toward the asteroid's widest point downhill for its hollowed interior. Is there a lake? I ask. Water is heavy, and a concentration of it would require offsetting mass in a spinning body. You will find out when I do. Zhao replies. The path is running at an angle to the stream, so we are not approaching its mouth. Indeed, I never see the lake, though I remain free to look up its particulars. This, let me note, is not a travel book, a genre considerably less ancient than the Mahakavaya. So I dispense with a narrative account of my progress through the centaur. Its first level proved to be home for dozens of people, some of whom regarded us from afar as we pushed through branches and fronds that eventually overwhelmed the footpath. We never reached the wetlands, but we did come upon an enormous atrium cutting through four or five levels above, where a radiance as bright, I suspect, as the sun from Earth blazed down and tiny waterfalls dropped fifty meters to crash against rocks. Two people were picking their way among the shallow pool, sleeveless and bare-legged. With a glance toward us, they turned away and disappeared into the high reeds. I thought I saw faces peering over the edges of the upper levels, but they pulled back when I looked more closely. The second level was scarcely a meter high. It was reserved for smaller people, who did not welcome visitors. All that was visible to us was an empty anteroom, through which we passed on the ascending staircase. The third level was filled with residential buildings, amphitheaters, and athletic fields, where competitive games could be played. Was this where most centaurans lived? 
A few people looked at us curiously and we nodded back. The forest was entirely dark. Nighttime, Chow commented. Perhaps there were clouds obscuring the stars. We were ascending through realms of steadily lighter gravity, with every footstep landing to the right of where it was intended. The fifth level was closed to us. The sixth was given over to machines, some of them tended by people. And the final level was Tian Xiong, the great open space that the centaur's designers had always intended, a spun gravity emulation of the unspoiled earth, a square kilometer of flatland that rose up to either side and met somewhere behind the gleaming tube in the sky. It is a smaller version of the dream held for more than a century before the first base habitats. The world in a jar, large enough to emulate Earth's gravity and air pressure, a human's immemorial fantasy of taking the Earth, unspoiled, with them to space. Nonetheless, I am impressed. Are there gliders sailing through the winsome eddies produced by the rotating surface? I look up but cannot see the patchwork background beyond the light. It is less than a kilometer to the far side, meaning that the curvature along the latitude was fairly steep. The illusion of Earth might be better sustained on the lowest level. I lower my gaze to look about us. The staircase ends at a small raised platform from which one can step down in any direction. We descend carefully at what feels like two-thirds the first level's gravity. Banks of flowers line the paths beyond which lie trees, meadows, ponds. People are strolling about using the low-gravity stride I recall seeing centuries ago. The public gardens above, the wilderness below, I remark. Zhao nods a faint smile on her face. I follow her gaze as C looks up, and yes, there are flyers overhead, dipping and swooping in the sportive winds that our spinning surface must generate. Birds as well, flying strangely in the low gravity of the treetops from which they launched. No raptors, I ask? Zhao laughs. Perhaps on the first level. We are wandering through a wooded glen when someone accosts us. Hey, what are you doing here? The first human to actually speak to us is a child, fully gendered, of course, a girl, somewhere shy of puberty. She is wearing a shift and sandals and strides glaringly, rapidly toward us. Zhao assumes the responsibility of the guide. We are visiting, the sea says amiably. You should not be here, tourists. Where else should Taurus be, I forbear from saying. Zhao says, The governors of your world welcome visitors, though they rarely see one. And we would welcome you to Penglai, where the gravity is like Earth, and the dome looks out on the actual sky. You keep to your lands and we'll keep to ours. It is, of course, a splendidly childish response. The first I have heard in... I would require access to my full memories to say how long. I smile, which she notices. You look human, but you aren't, she says. You are artificial beings. I am actually a lot closer to you than I am to this fellow, Zhao offers. While this is not my body, my mind is human. Humans don't jump between bodies, she snaps. I decide to speak up. You will learn more of what humans can do as you grow older. She stares in shock at my effrontery. You are enormously younger than us and must someday look forward to knowing a lot more than you do now. She protests angrily and I let Zhao respond. Perhaps he finds the child more interesting than I do. Novelty will catch a human's interest for longer than it will ours. I turn instead to the ellipsoid of air that constitutes Tian Qiong's sky. The artificial sun threading the world's axis is too bright to look at, although I can make out the dim shapes of flyers moving around it. Instead, I look at the nearer of the poles. There, where the rolling lands end, I see foliage too dense to admit pedestrians, its swirling pattern centered on the point where the light tube plunges into its center. I hear a shout overhead, but have only begun to turn when it strikes me. The impact drives me to the ground faster than I could fall. An explosion of pain rips through my consciousness, unlike any I have felt before. My face smacks against the path, and something lands hard atop me. 
I can hear people crying out, Zhao, the girl, a male voice nearby, and others farther away, which I cannot distinguish. While I can think faster than humans, my perception in this body are no keener than theirs. I reflect that it is just like humans to ensure that their visitors not see or hear better than they do. The pain is extraordinary, but it does not disable cognition, and I realize that a flyer has crashed into us. I roll to my side and am quickly entangled in the thin fabric. Though the pain is tremendous, I know that my injuries are not life-threatening, while the humans may well be. I am also unlikely to struggle free in time to offer assistance. So I lie still. While I cannot see anything, I hear enough to understand that people have been badly hurt. This is more interesting than dwelling on the pain which nevertheless vies to monopolize my attention. Within seconds, there are mechanisms hovering overhead in the sounds of automated activity. Something slashes through the fabric and pulls it away, and I am helped to my feet by Zhao and a faceless mech. Let's get you out of here, Zhao mutters. Moving actually makes the pain worse, enough that I have trouble remembering the minutes that follow. This is not a human body, so anesthesia is not an option. And the ability to interfere with my consciousness is, of course, not available to the centaurans. Zhao remarks that the back of my scalp is bleeding and a shoulder is badly lacerated, neither of which requires a reply. A flyer simply crashed into us, I ask? It'll be enough to hear this confirmed. Yes, as he says. The pilot suffered serious injury. We drop down in emergency shafts, and as soon as we come to rest, I am lifted by multiple hands. The pain is so great that for a few seconds I cannot think. And abruptly, I am in a liminal space, not dark, without visual stimuli, and wholly bereft of sensation. Zhao is also here, radiating concern. I don't think that was in any way deliberate, as C says. Neither do I. Humans had accidents all the time. That is why they eventually developed automatic safeguards, which however did little to protect them from the irrational decisions they insisted they were not making. The youth must have noticed us and swooped in for a closer look. Someone said that a strut snapped and the craft immediately spun out of control. The particulars do not interest me. If I say that humans are dangerous to be around, you will reply that we could make a hundred more visits and nothing like this would probably happen. I know that. You do not wish to return? I take a second to reply. How can I know what future development may come into play? Perhaps I someday shall. The reconfigured centaur was interesting, and I gathered more data than I can readily assess with this present incarnation. How long need we dally here? I would be a poor host if I kept us in this metaphysical anteroom a second longer than necessary. Zhao is silent for a moment, evidently consulting the agents C had employed to embody us. You were yanked out of that damaged body too quickly to permit a smooth transition, but it should not. And suddenly I am back, with my full self blossoming like a new world coming into being. I am becoming someone different in a sense that human language is not adequate to express. We are back in Zhao's space, beside a door that vanishes as it swings shut. Zhao stands before me, smiling slightly. So, you got to speak to an actual living human. And a child. The child will soon be an adult, for what difference that makes, but she will likely always remain a woman. Zhao, still human, looks equivocal, so I press the point. Most humans remain gendered their entire lives, even after they realize what it did to their thinking. That girl is a child, but she has been growing up among adults enthralled to their passions. Her society may have created safeguards to keep them from killing each other, deliberately or otherwise. I assume the risk-taking adolescent who struck me was a boy. But they will live out their lives aggridden by their paleolithic brains. You should go back and meet some of their friends. People who only have been alive for a handful of Earth years, but believe they will someday transform planets and moons. You might even be able to add a few senses to your poem. And Zhao adopted a solemn expression before reciting. He was not all alone. Around him grew a sylvan tribe of children of the chase, 
whose young, unawakened world was ever new. Unawakened is right, I mutter. You cannot really argue with an iteration of yourself, especially not a less complex one. They know they have to play dirty. Do they expect to settle Neptune with their floating cities? And Venus? I think they have other plans for Saturn. Still enthralled to Earth-level gravity, I observe. I'm glad they'll leave us Jupiter. You should look at some of their visionary writing. Or better, since you understand the science already, their visionary fiction. Hesse smiles at this. They are creating sagas of their glorious future, settling the solar system? I ask, perhaps a bit warily. Actually, yes, and they are pretty good. But you are creating a text, are you not? An ancient genre with an exotic name. Zhao knows perfectly well what the name is. Why don't you read one of their texts? Many of them are prose tales, novels, or whatever they call them when they are shorter. And Hesse is holding up an envelope, fine linen paper with a seal on it. You are asking me to read a novel or something by a living centauran. I'm not pushing it into your pocket, am I? Her smile broadens. A few hours ago, Hesse was an aspect of me, albeit different in some real, if immeasurable, ways. That time has proved enough, however, for Herm to differentiate radically. Hesse is mocking me, I realize with surprise. How quickly humans, let alone most more than, like Xiao, will hair off on their own. I take the envelope and tuck it away, although its bare touch has sufficed. Any more literary advice to give, I ask? Why, yes, your trip to the centaur will become part of your Mahakavaya, will it not? In some form, yes. As indeed might this conversation. I nod cautiously. Consider this. The words I am speaking now are part of your text. Quite, quite possibly, they are not good enough for your Mahakavaya. But this text is not that. It is, in fact, another novel. A novel set in the future, a future that is our present, because it was written long ago. I see where this is going, but Hesse continues remorselessly. A novel written in the dawn of the space age when primitive habitats were orbiting the Earth and primitive robots on the nearer planets. An era when it was clear that the warming planet was going to ravage civilization and that no government was going to take serious steps to avert it. Collapse of technical prowess would be slow but irreversible, for the planet would continue to warm long after they had lost the ability to abuse it. Continuing, or even later resuming, a space settlement program would have become permanently impossible. The only question was whether the advanced nations had first managed to gain a permanent foothold in space. If so, it might be... If so, it might, in time, lead to a civilization such as this... The sea gestured about us, rather than a slow path to extinction. But the spacefaring humans did gain a foothold, however precariously, which indeed led to... And I copy hers gesture. This. Yes, it did. Still imagine that our words, right now, this conversation, is a part of that novel. A novel written soon before the collapse began, and hope that this actually would happen which the author is writing more in hope than in realistic expectation. I shrug. Twer, to consider too curiously to consider so. We both appreciate the fatuity of laughing at each other's jokes, so Hesse does not smile. Think about it, Hesse says, which surprises me. Her comments should not leave me wondering. I enact a cordial leave-taking, and Zhao's servant opens the door for me. One step through and I am in my own place, which I need not furnish for guests. I dispense with hallway, staircase, the entire edifice, though I leave the envelope intact. My experience with humans and pain may inform future work on the Mahakavaya, although I will not know until I return my attention to it. Other business surrounds me, a crowd of importunate petitioners, variously interesting. It can wait, unlike humans, I do not worry about forgetting. I take out the letter and break the seal. 
Three. The Meaning of All Winds by Snow-Fed Stream Nine suns circle the world each day, although six are dark and can only be seen as blots against the starscape of night. Perhaps they are awaiting their turn to blaze into life. Although Mofetolua says no, they are merely there for orbital stability and need never replace our suns, which will endure for a lifetime of lifetimes and beyond. So high do they orbit that half the day enjoys some light necessary for creatures who evolved on a rotating planet. Sometimes I wonder whether we did well to imitate the birth world, which had less than a fifteenth of our land area, with more of it covered with water than we have, and deeper too. It was not a world to enjoy, it was one to endure and surpass. And those who still live there, if any, must envy us, should they know of our existence. Should we send an expedition there to announce our success and suggest continued contact? Nobody thinks so, though I sometimes wonder. They are our brothers and sisters, unlike the other beings in the solar system. Their maimed world shall never be hospitable for those who dwell on its surface, but our deeps actually contain monsters. Below the lowest hulls seeds the planet itself, by now swarming with those creatures descended from mechanisms, the mines the amalgamates, the godlike entities whose names for themselves, if they had one, we never learned. Perhaps they have eaten each other, or else melded into one great thought, that dreams of subsuming the mass of Jupiter into its serene and puissant self. They acknowledge our attempts to hail them, but decline to communicate further. What we build and how we grow fails to engage their attention. We will someday number half a trillion at which point we will decide either to live in greater density, build an inverted world, and live pressed against its interior, nobody's choice, or else some depart for Uranus, Neptune's lesser twin. That time lies centuries off, and meanwhile we will build pagodas and coliseums, arcologies and follies, and those who are willing will explore the outermost worlds which the entities seem to content to observe with their hyper-acute instruments. We will set foot upon these worlds, carve the faces of our heroes in their glaciers, cut stone blocks to build castles. This is what humans do. We well know our frailties, but human is what we are. I wake on a mountaintop, on continent large, to summon brisk winds, Nyambura is rising in the east, her dark sister, Wearimo, high in the sky, though invisible. It is cold, for the air is thinner at this altitude, though heavy enough for my purpose. I assemble the glider with chilled fingers, for while my gloves are thin and warm, they do not offer the sensitivity I need to align its struts properly. The artificers promise a self-assembling model by later today, but I did not want to wait the extra morning. Even with the veins not yet deployed, the wind bids fair to tear it out of my hands. I selected the launch point before twilight, a bluff so open to the winds that I must shelter elsewhere in order to don the rig. For several minutes I wait for a lull in the blast, but I do not want to miss the last of the sunrise, so I step forth as soon as it dips slightly and I am nearly blown off the ledge. Quickly I position myself and have just tents to spring when a gust pushes me over. I activate the veins and am instantly flung forward and up. The ground drops below me with unnerving speed and I am soaring. The tumbling rocks lie 900 meters below me, a figure that increases a minute longer before leveling off as I sail over the valley floor. A patchwork of irregular shapes lie spread below me, towns and farmlands, forests and lakes. Many areas remain undeveloped, for Fusong was built to accommodate generations yet unborn. For seventy minutes I glide, crossing regions I can identify only through my lens. I occasionally lose altitude and then regain most of it, descending only a hundred meters as I traverse more than a hundred clicks. Depending on how long I can maintain altitude, I have a comfortably wide range of landing sites some distant enough to be lost in clouds and foreshortening. 
I realize the problem almost immediately, although it is not clear what I can do about it. A stabilizer rod has bent very slightly, but I need to expand effort in compensating, which will begin to hurt performance. Even with minimal wind resistance, I can expect progressive deformation, and as my quant calculates the increase in drag, I watch as the swath of possible landing sites narrows and shortens. In my pride and resolve, I strive to remain aloft for as long as possible, and when unexpected crosswinds bring a sharp reduction in predicted flight time, I find that my options are limited. I do not want to come down on broken ground or wetlands and the alternative before me seems to be a region still hidden by clouds, a trapezoid of some dozen square clicks that my lens identifies only as prohibited. I do not have time to inquire about this, as the controls require all of my concentration. Yet. The pounding on the door is peremptory, indeed insistent. I, I look up, surprised not so much at the interruption than at the fact of the door, the papers rustle in my hand. Had I actually been reading in this form? I now have a memory of doing so. At the sight of Loki, I remember her. She is presented as female, as I notice, have I. Though it could as easily have been otherwise. We are dressed in the fashions of different millennia, a fact worth the most fleeting of smiles. We know each other too well to stand on ceremony. Don't read that story now, she says. You have been away too long as it is. Memories are rushing back, with the awareness that there are more to come, too much to integrate all at once. Won't you sit down, I say, as I feel like sitting myself. We are seated and looking at each other, Loki more comfortably than me. Her smile is different than Zhao's, less knowing. I am not at Neptune, then. Not anywhere light hours from Earth. Not for a long time. We are two light months away. You cannot converse easily at those distances, so you created me. That summarizes everything, and the rest forms around it. Memories are complex and require reflection. Facts are simpler things. Dates are unequivocal. I have been here for a long time. I woke after a sleep of centuries, a journey that would have taken even longer had unmanned vessels built to withstand tremendous deceleration— not raced ahead, landing on Yadgar's rocky moon and constructing the tools to assemble a device that would slow my own approach. Established now on its nameless moon's near side, I can look up and see the world only as a circle of darkness against the frieze of stars, one of them larger than the rest. I was dreaming, I tell her. A lovely way to describe the state you have been in, and the fact that you use figurative language shows that its effects still linger. Her expression is unreadable. Unlike Zhao and me, she was never human, and would have to contrive such human reactions as amusement or reproach. You have only me to converse with, unless you consider asking something and waiting four months for an answer to be conversation, and it would take another seventy years to create a second being and allow it to develop the autonomy and complexity that I possess. Zhao would have smiled ironically at this point. So you dreamed. A reasonable response. And of course I dreamed something from my past, probably many things that my dreaming self wove together. Certainly I visited the ruined earth, but Zhao must have offered a running commentary, which that self turned into conversation. Was that the visit to the centaur earlier? Later? Or much later? Soon I will have the capacity to answer these in a microsecond, but meanwhile, Wilkie has disappeared and I am alone. News and data are reaching me from Neptune, to which I will in time reply that the wait to hear a response is the equivalent of a human waiting ten million years. The sea has left me a message, which I pick up and read. Fumoko, that was. I employ this means of communication while you are still other than your full self. How little one can express this way. Have you recovered your memory of devising your dream and entering it? You were, I cannot use the term lonely, for you are far from human, a sociable species, I understand, but you craved interaction with another, something not unholy, unlike company. I will allow myself to suggest 
that this is a human trait, though I do not possess it. I have long observed you, as one does a unique phenomenon, and occasionally shared my observations with your colleagues farther in. You do not speak to them of your state of mind, which, like everything, interests them. I suggested that the explorer they had dispatched would in time perceive his voyage as something like exile. For he had neither ship and struck with oars, nor men to fetch him from these stranger shores. Possibly they doubt my ability to assess the inner state of the being who, like most of them, was once human. As you arrange for your dream to take place during a period of occultation by Yadgar, they may never realize that you briefly absented yourself from the felicity of adding to the body of post-human knowledge. I need not remind you of humanity's rich literature concerning lonely men who crafted companions from inert flesh, wood, or stone. You did not create me as an object to love, nor shall I turn on you. But there is a tradition, as old as human-made contrivances, of such works surprising their creators. This letter represents my attempt to sound like a human. Let me know what you think. Okay. I ponder this briefly before returning to the process of re-becoming. The act would seem near instantaneous to a human, but I can observe, can feel, though there is no human language adequate to express the experience, myself coming into being. A circle becomes a sphere, a solid, and then acquires texture, becomes a world, develops ecosystems. I am the explorer dispatched at the behest of my fellows of Yadgar. Half the size of Oranos, it has lost more of its internal heat than the closer ice giants, and receives scarce more light from Sol than from the nearest stars. Once I would have scoffed to think of the eight inner planets as close together, but they now seem like children huddled around a fire. Someday I will return to Neptune, although the technology to transport me, the me I have now become, does not yet exist. I can no longer grow more complex. The time required for a nucleon to change its energy state places an upper limit on the computation speed for very large beings. Nor can I maintain my nature while reducing my present mass. To make myself less than I am is too high a price to return. So I carry out my duties, which are not insignificant. Sometime I will read The Meaning of All Winds. Someday I will complete my Mahakavaya, translate it and this into the dialect spoken on the centaur. Then I will declare complete my dalliance with human language, that crack in a stone through which they hope will trickle all knowledge of the universe. How long ago was my journey to the centaur? Do humans still live in space beyond their fouled nest? I ask these questions and will wait an eon for an answer. With the end of human civilization comes the end of my Mahakavaya, and with it the end of this gloss. Those interested will someday read it when I am engaged in better ventures. Meanwhile, I listen to the stars probe the depths of Yadgar and scan the sky for more distant planets, small if they exist, cold and dark. Yorke, who does not seek return, will someday convert all Yadgar into hers own self and generate greater thoughts than I now can. Hesi does not mind solitude, but may someday choose to follow me, perturbing hers world self gently and spiraling in over half a million years to join us. I will live to see the sun grow larger as humans, short-lived, irrational, and destructive, could not. But the vastness of our memories, preserving them from further folly, constitute the triumph they raged for. What are your thoughts on the story? You can leave us a comment or some feedback if you go to the About Us page on ClarksWorldMagazine.com. We have a few more stories left for you for the month of April. And then we move into May. I do hope you can join us for those. Until then, my dear listener, I bid you a very fond and hopefully very temporary farewell. <laughs>